Last week, we studied the first part of chapter 28 in the book of Genesis. And tonight, we're going to finish that chapter. Now, from verse 10 on, uh, the focus is all on Jacob. And he's going to be the main character until we get all the way to Joseph. Now, don't get me wrong. Isaac and Esau are going to be mentioned, but every time they're mentioned, they're secondary characters. You see, now that we know that the blessings of Abraham are going to be fulfilled through Jacob's descendants, the focus is all on him. Remember, the blessing designated him as the recipient of the birthright. Therefore, he's now become the patriarch of the family. So when we talk about the patriarchs, who are we talking about? We're talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So what we studied last week and the few weeks before that is monumental. Because if you don't understand that he was the rightful heir to the birthright, you do not understand why he was one of the patriarchs. So this is why the story is all about him from this point on until we get to Joseph. Now, to help you see the big picture, let's talk about the main characters of the Old Testament and how the Bible is laid out. Genesis has six main characters, beginning with Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. If you can remember those six guys, you know the book of Genesis because those are the main characters in the book. After Genesis, the next four books, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, has one main character, and who would that be? Moses. When Moses dies, the torch is passed on to Joshua, and he becomes the main character. He's the person who's going to lead the children of Israel into the promised land, and the sixth book of the Bible, named Joshua, is all about him and the conquest of the promised land. The fulfillment, or I should say partial fulfillment, of the promises that God made unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, when Joshua dies, there is no supreme leader over Israel. Instead, they are ruled by judges. And the book of Judges records the stories of all the judges. Until finally, the people demand a king. So Israel becomes a kingdom ruled by a king. And the first three kings, Saul, David, and Solomon, are the most famous. And then you have Rehoboam. Rehoboam is Solomon's son, and he kind of screws things up. He divides the kingdom. There's a big split. And from that time on, the 12 tribes were divided into two nations. The 10 northern tribes are referred to as Israel or the nation of Israel. And if you don't understand that as you're reading through the Old Testament and it talks about Israel, you might still have this preconceived idea that Israel refers to all of the 12 tribes, but it doesn't. Once the kingdom splits, it splits into two nations. The ten northern tribes are then referred to as the nation of Israel. And the two southern tribes, which are Judah and Benjamin, are referred to as the nation of Judah. Now, most of the prophetic books were written during the period of the kings. And the prophets, along with the kings that they minister to, are the main characters in those books. But the focus is placed more on the messages of the prophets than the prophets themselves. And then you have this period known as the Babylonian captivity. And the books of Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Lamentations, and Daniel focus on that period of time. And again, the focus is placed more on the message of the prophets than the prophets themselves. Now, after the captivity period, you have the return period, where many of the Jews return to Israel. Now, the main characters during that period of time are Nehemiah and Ezra. Nehemiah is going to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem because at that time, you cannot have a city without walls. Not unless you want to be conquered by everyone. So Nehemiah rebuilds the walls to Jerusalem, and then you have Ezra. And what Ezra wants to do is he wants to get the temple rebuilt and to do what? To get the people to obey the law to get them back practicing Judaism. And that's a quick synopsis of the Old Testament books of the Bible. But my point is this. From Genesis 28, 10 on, the main character is Jacob until we get to Joseph. So now we begin the study of Jacob's life as an adult. Yes, we've had Jacob introduced to us, but it was as a child. Now we're going to focus in on the adult life of Jacob. So turn with me, if you would, to the book of Genesis, chapter 28. Let's read verse number 10 again. 
Meanwhile, Jacob left Beersheba and traveled towards Haran. Now, the correct pronunciation is Haran, but we're from Cherokee County. None of us have ever heard it like that, right? Did you grow up hearing it, Haran? We'll stick with that. So anyways, it says, Meanwhile, Jacob left Beersheba and traveled towards Haran. Now, as I told you last week, Haran is about 460 miles from Beersheba as the crow flies. But of course, you wouldn't travel that way. Instead, you would have traveled the route that the caravans took, and that would add about 140 miles to the trip. So basically, we're talking about a 600-mile journey. Now, if you traveled about 20 to 25 miles a day, it would take you approximately one month to get there. Now, contrary to what most Christians think, Jacob wasn't a young man when he traveled to Haran. I don't know why, but the majority of Christians think Jacob was in his early 20s when he traveled to Haran. I used to think that. I can remember when I first became a Christian, and I felt like I needed to read the Bible through. And so all those familiar stories in, that I had heard in Sunday school, I started reading about. And for some reason, I always pictured Jacob as being in his early 20s when he traveled to Haran. How many of you pictured him in his early 20s? How many of you knew he was in his 40s? You smart people. Yeah, there's a few of you that did. But what we need to understand is he wasn't in his early 20s. He was over 40 when he started his trip to Haran in order to find a wife and also to get away from Esau because of the threats that he'd made. Now, let me show you how we know that he was in his 40s. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Genesis chapter 26, verse 34. At the age of 40, Esau married two Hittite wives, Judith, the daughter of Beri, and Basemoth, the daughter of Elon. So how old was Esau when he got married? 40, it tells us. Now, right before Jacob left for Haran, Rebekah was complaining about Esau's wife. How many of you remember that? Yes, it was the very last verse in chapter 27. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, even though they're talking about the threat that Esau made on Jacob's life, all of a sudden, Rebekah turns and begins complaining about Esau's wife, which tells us that Esau was married at that time. And since Esau and Jacob were twins, Jacob had to have been in his 40s when he left for Haran. Now, does everyone understand the logic that I used right there? Good. So Jacob wasn't a young man in his early 20s when he left for Haran. He was in his 40s. Now, why in the world is that important? It's important because when you read different commentators, many of them overlook this. And that's always surprising to me because these are scholars. These are people who have been educated in the Word of God and how to study the Word of God, and that's all they do for a living. They study the Word of God. And yet many commentators claim that, oh, Jacob was a young man and he'd never traveled away from home. He was a mama's boy. He's someone who stayed in the tents. And he was very frightened and scared and God had to grow him up. So he went on this trip alone, 600 miles. But people, that's not true. Jacob would have been very comfortable traveling by himself because in all probability, he was probably somewhere between 42 to 45 years old. He is a grown man. He was very responsible. He took care of the family business. He probably had gone on many trips with caravans to be able to go trade for what they needed and also to sell some of the products that they produced. And as a result of that, he was very comfortable with that. So as you're reading these commentators and they talk about God is going to use this to grow him up, that's a bunch of hogwash. Now, look at verse number 11. At sundown, he arrived at a good place to set up camp, and he stopped there for the night. Jacob found a stone to rest his head against, and he lay down to sleep. Now, we find out later on that the place that he stopped at is called Bethel. Actually, he names the place. It's really called Luz, but because of what takes place, He renames it, but it's Bethel. Bethel is about 10 and a half miles north of Jerusalem, and it's about 50 to 55 miles away from Beersheba, which is where Jacob started. So Jacob was about three days into his journey when he stopped at Bethel for the night. Now, normally, he wouldn't camp out. You need to understand that Isaac was a very, very wealthy man. Remember when we were studying Abraham, and I came to the point that I said that Abraham was not just rich, Abraham was filthy rich. And he was. He was one of the richest men in that area. But then 
Isaac got the majority of the inheritance. And Isaac was blessed by God. And so even though he had all of this wealth that he had inherited from Abraham, God blessed him and he produced even more. So Isaac was a very, very wealthy man. So Jacob going on this trip isn't going to be camping out the whole way. No, he's, he's a very wealthy person. He's not even going to be walking. In all probability, he's, he, he's riding on a camel, and if he doesn't take a camel, we know it's at least a donkey, and he probably has several donkeys or camels behind him filled with supplies. So what you would do if you're traveling along with that is you're going to stay in lodges. You're not going to camp out. But the sun begins to go down as he's traveling, and because it's unsafe for him to continue to travel at night, he stops and he makes camp, which is a really interesting thing because the place he makes camp is also the place that Abraham had camped at when God first spoke to him. So he comes to this place called Lutz that he renames Bethel, and he makes camp. Now, I can remember thinking when I was a child as I read this story, why would Jacob use a stone as a pillow? Has anyone ever read that and thought the same thing? Because that would be very, very uncomfortable. How many of you camp out? I'm not talking about the nice trailer that's air conditioned with its own bathroom. I'm talking about the tent. And you know, you look up there and you go, ooh, those public restrooms look pretty nasty. But when you camp out, maybe you kind of uh, have a little bit of luxuries. You have the air mattress, the nice uh, sleeping bag that comes out. But the worst thing that can happen is you lay your bed out and there's a rock. And that, isn't that uncomfortable? So I can remember reading this and thinking, why in the world would he have a rock that he places as a pillow? Well, we need to understand, again, that he's not walking all by himself and all he's carrying with him is a backpack. No, he comes from a very wealthy family. You need to understand, when Rebecca told him, go pack, it wasn't he ran to his tent and took out a few things. No, he goes and he makes preparation with the supplies he's going to need for a 600-mile trip. He's going to have the animal that he's going to be riding on, plus the animals that he'll need to transport all of his supplies. And on those animals is going to be plenty of blankets and possibly some pillows. So all he's doing is he's taking this stone and he's going to place it down in order to elevate his head, but then he's going to lay out all of these blankets and this pillow so now his head can be elevated, but he has this pillow or folded blankets on top of it. So it's not the way that we think. And then he falls asleep and Jacob had a dream. Look at verses 12 and 13. As he slept, he dreamed of a stairway that reached from the earth up to heaven. And he saw the angels of God going up and down the stairway. At the top of the stairway stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather Abraham, and the God of your father Isaac. And it's kind of interesting. He doesn't say, and your God. Because up to this point... He is the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac. And even though Jacob is in his 40s, he is not the God of Jacob yet. Because Jacob has not made that commitment yet. Let me just tell you something. You might come from a Christian home. Your grandparents might be Christians. Your parents might be Christians. Maybe you have someone in the family that's a minister, a pastor, that doesn't make you a Christian. You are not a Christian until Jesus is your Lord and you have a personal relationship with him. God has chosen Jacob to be the one that the blessings and the promises of Abraham are going to flow through him and his descendants, but Jacob has not yet made that commitment to God. And so in this dream... He reveals himself and he says, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather Abraham, the God of your father Isaac. The ground you are lying on belongs to you. I am giving it to you and to your descendants. Now, this dream was a turning point in Jacob's life. In fact, the dream was to Jacob what the burning bush was to Moses and what the Damascus Road experience was to Paul. 
It was life-changing. But this is not the only time that God spoke to Jacob in a supernatural way. Sometimes as we're reading along, you know, we forget that God didn't just speak to Jacob one time. God spoke to Jacob seven times in a supernatural way. This is the first of seven. At least six other times, the scripture records that God speaks to Jacob in a supernatural way. He spoke to him in Genesis chapter 31, verse number three. You jump down to verses 11 and 12, that's the same instance. Then he spoke to him in Genesis chapter 32, verses 1 and 2. Again, he spoke to him in Genesis chapter 32, verses 24 and 30. And then again in chapter 35, verse number 1. And then at the end of that chapter, in verses 9 through 13. And last but not least, in chapter 46, verses 1 through 4. So all in all, God spoke to Jacob audibly, either through a dream or audibly speaking to him, Seven times, but this is the first time that he's ever spoken to Jacob, and he does it in a dream. Now, just because I've told you that he spoke to Jacob supernaturally seven times doesn't mean that he didn't speak to to Jacob at other times. Those are just the seven times that he records, or the scripture records, him doing so. Does that make sense? Now, let's look at the dream itself because the dream is the very first time that God speaks to Jacob in a supernatural way. Look back at verse number 12 and the first part of verse number 13. As he slept, he dreamed of a stairway that reached from the earth up to heaven. And he saw the angels of God going up and down the stairway. At the top of the stairway stood the Lord. Now, the dominant feature in this dream was a staircase that went from earth to to heaven. It was almost as wide as it was high because angels were going up and down it simultaneously. In fact, most of us don't catch that. There wasn't just a few angels. If you notice in the dream, it says, and he saw the angels of God, almost as if he's saying, I saw all of the angels of God. Now, if you remember when we were studying the book of Revelation verse by verse, there are so many angels but you almost can't count them all. In fact, in the book of Revelation, it's as if you can't count them all. There's that many. And so he saw this staircase with the angels of God, and the implication is the majority of them. So we're not talking about just a few angels. We're talking about a multitude of angels. And these angels are going up to heaven and coming down simultaneously. So you couldn't have this normal staircase. How many times have you tried to go down either a staircase or down a hallway that was very narrow and someone else was coming and they were a fat boy like me? What did you have to do to get by? You either had to turn sideways, which in my case doesn't really help, or you would suck in and try to get by. Well, Jacob has this dream. And there's this staircase. Now, it's kind of interesting. The Hebrew word that's used in the King James Version is translated as ladder. But when we think of a ladder, we think of different rungs. We think of of, of two parallel pieces of lumber or aluminum or some type of material. And it has rungs in it and you climb it like this. But that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about a stairway. And on this stairway, you have a multitude of angels. More than he can even count. He just assumes that it's almost all of the angels of God because there's so many. And he's blown away because they're walking from earth up to heaven and God is at the top of it. Now we think, well, if it's so wide, how could God, how big is God? How big is he? I don't know. But the Lord is at the top of the staircase and these angels are walking up to him and simultaneously angels are walking down and there's so many he can't even count them. So this staircase had to be extremely wide. And at the top of the staircase in heaven was, as I said, God. Now again, the insinuation was that the angels were traveling from earth to heaven to report to God and then traveling back down to carry out God's commands on the earth. Now, The scriptures teach that angels are supernatural beings that carry out God's plans and they listen and obey God's commands. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Psalm, chapter 103, verse number 20. I could give you lots of scripture tonight, but I'm just going to give you a few. I'm going to give you this one and then one in Hebrews. 
Notice what it says. Praise the Lord, you angels, you mighty ones who carry out his plans, listening for each of his commands. So angels are servants of God, but more importantly, they're spiritual beings, and their job is to carry out God's plans on the earth. And they listen for his commands. They don't do their own thing. They do what God tells them to do. Everyone with me? Now, the main function of angels is not just to carry out God's plan, but to carry out God's plans for humans. Yes. To carry out God's plans for humans on this earth. Look with me, if you would, in the book of Hebrews, the first chapter, Verse number 14. Notice what it says. Therefore, angels are only servants. They do what God commands them to do. Spirits sent to care for people who will inherit salvation. Sent. Sent by who? God, because they listen to his commands. Their job is to carry out his plans. But they're sent for a purpose. They're sent to care for people who will inherit salvation. Now, This is just a dream. This isn't real. It's a dream. So there's not a literal staircase to heaven on which angels ascend or descend. There's no such thing, and the Bible isn't teaching that. This was only a dream. But it's symbolic. And it's symbolic of something that's very real. And that reality is that God has angelic beings that he sends out to carry out his work on the earth. And many of those angels were being sent to protect Jacob and to help him. Because here Jacob is, and he's kind of been cast out of the family. He's excited about going to Haran because he's finally going to get a wife. And how many of you men know, he that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. And when you're in your early 40s, you're thinking, my gosh, this is hard. So he's excited about going to Haran, but he's not excited about the circumstances. He would have never thought about trying to trick his father into giving him the birthright. Mama did that. And he really didn't know what to do. Do I obey mama or do I disobey mama? Because this isn't right what she's asking me to do. But he obeys her because she says, you do what I tell you to do. And if there's a curse, let it fall upon me. And of course, now Esau threatens to kill him. Isaac, his father, goes ahead and he gives him the blessing because he realizes his eyes are open that God is the one who's chosen Jacob, that Esau is not worthy of the birthright. He's disqualified himself because of his character, or I should say lack of character. And Jacob is the one who truly deserves it. And God has not only shown that to be true, but he's also specified before they were ever born that Jacob was the one who was supposed to receive it. So here Jacob is... He's done what God wants, but now the circumstances at home are not good. So he's being sent away, but he's also being sent away for a good thing. He's excited, but now he's here and he's a little fearful. Because, you know, I've received this blessing and I know what it means. It means that I'm not only going to inherit a double portion of the physical inheritance of my father, but it means I'm the patriarch of the family, which means that the promises that God made to Abraham that I've heard about and the promises that he made to my father Isaac, which I've heard about, are now going to be fulfilled through my descendants. And he's thinking, can this be? And then he has this dream. And God's at the top of the staircase. And notice what he tells Jacob in this dream. Look at verse number 13 again. And let's also read verses 14 and 15. At the top of the stairway stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather Abraham and the God of your father Isaac. Oh boy, the top guy, the one who made these promises and and promised these blessings to come upon his grandfather and his father. The ground you are lying on belongs to you. Oh. Then God's recognizing the blessing should have come to me. I knew it. They told me it. But now I'm hearing it straight from God. I'm giving it to you and your descendants. Your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. They will spread out in all directions to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. What's more, I am with you. And I will protect you wherever you go. Okay. Thank you, God. Because... 
You know, even though he gave me the blessing, I didn't act righteously, I didn't act honorably, I did something I shouldn't have done, but you're telling me, in spite of that, what's more, I am with you, and I will protect you wherever you go. One day I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have finished giving you everything I have promised you. Now, wait a minute. He hasn't made a promise yet up until this time. Why is he acting like everything I have promised you, like it was made before this time? Because he's heard of the promises he made to his grandfather and to his father. And the implication was they, those promises would not be fulfilled except through their descendants. And now I understand that these promises are going to be fulfilled through my descendants. I'm the one. But here's the thing I want you to notice. When God spoke to Jacob in this dream, he said exactly what he said to Abraham. Wow. Did you catch that? The very thing he promised to Abraham is the very thing he promised to Isaac. If you remember when we studied him speaking to Isaac, we compared what he said to Abraham to what he said to Isaac, and it was exactly the same thing. A few minor changes because he's dealing with individuals, but it's the very same thing. And now he speaks to Jacob, and he says the very same thing to him that he said to Abraham. Look at what God promised Abraham in Genesis chapter 13, verses 14 through 17. And as we're reading it, I want you to think in your mind. I want you to compare it to the promise that he just made to Jacob that we read. Notice what it says in Genesis 13, 14 through 17. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. There it is, same thing he told Jacob. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth. Did you notice that? That's exactly what he told Jacob here in this dream. So that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants could also be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. So basically, God is promising to fulfill the promises that he made to Abraham through Jacob's descendants. Now, the meaning of this dream is very clear. As I said, this is a dream. There's not a literal staircase, but this is a symbolic dream. And the meaning of this dream is very clear. God has made specific promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and those promises will be fulfilled. No ifs, ands, or buts. In fact, God has a multitude of angels at his disposal to help him carry out his plans. And those angels will not only carry out God's plans, but they will also supernaturally protect and help Jacob and all of his descendants until these promises be fulfilled. That's the meaning of this dream. All of these angels going up and these angels coming down are being sent out to do God's plans and to help serve and protect Jacob and his descendants till the promises are fulfilled. Now that's amazing. And he's telling him it doesn't matter where you go. Look at this staircase. See all of these angels. Trust me, Jacob. There's not a thing that I can't do. There's not a place that you can go. There's not a situation you can be placed in or circumstances you can be in that will alter the fact that I've made these promises and I will fulfill it. That's the meaning of this dream. Now, here's what's interesting. Almost 2,000 years later, Jesus comes on the scene at the beginning of his ministry and he refers to Jacob's dream. Yeah. But before I show you what Jesus said about the dream, let me set the stage. Jesus is now choosing his disciples, and he has just chosen Philip to be one of them. And right after that, Philip goes to Nathanael, and he told him that we found the Messiah. It's Jesus, or his name is Jesus, and he's from Nazareth. And of course, Nathanael's a little bit skeptical because many have come claiming to be the Messiah. In fact, you can just read Jewish history and many people came claiming to be the Messiah. So when Philip comes and says, we have found him, the one that Moses wrote about, the one that the prophets prophesied about, the Messiah, his name is Jesus and he's from Nazareth. So 
Nathaniel's a little bit skeptical. And notice what he says. He says, can anything good come from Nazareth? So Philip told him, well, come and see for yourself. So as he's coming to Jesus, because it's quite a ways away, Philip had to go find Nathanael, and then they're walking back to Jesus. Jesus sees him coming, and he says, now here's a genuine son of Israel, and he has complete integrity. And Nathanael hears that, and he replies, excuse me, I don't think we've ever met before. So how do we know you, or how do you know me? And Jesus replies, I saw you when you were sitting under the fig tree when Philip found you. And people, that blows Nathaniel's mind. And he thinks, wow, he saw something without even being there. He knows exactly what happened. This guy must be the Messiah. So he says to Jesus, Rabbi, which means what? Teacher, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. And it's kind of interesting because Jesus says, you come to that conclusion after that? Son, you haven't seen anything yet. You're going to walk with me. You're going to see me heal people without limbs. You're going to see me raise the dead. You're going to see mighty miracles. This is nothing. Of course, that's not exactly how he says it. But that's what Jesus is thinking when he says, you come to that conclusion after that one little thing? In fact, Let's actually read the story. It's found in John chapter 1. Let's read verses 43 through 49. It says, The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and he said to him, Come, follow me. Now, you know, I can remember being a kid and, and watching this and I'm thinking, Man, these guys had such great faith because Jesus walks by and he says, Come, follow me. And they just get up and follow him. They didn't even know him. No, 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 that's not true. Jesus had already started his ministry and they're listening to his teaching. And they know he's a rabbi. And here's one of the things that rabbis would do. They would find disciples and then they would mentor them. And so they had heard Jesus and so he's walking along. And Philip's already knows that this man is a great teacher. And they're seeing just a few of his works. So he says, come, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. Philip went to look for Nathaniel, And he told him, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus. He's the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth, exclaimed Nathaniel. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Well, come and see for yourself, Philip replied. As they approached, Jesus said, Now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. How do you know about me? In other words, excuse me, have we met before? How do you know about me? Nathaniel asked. Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. You could see me. You knew where I was and what I was doing. And you've been here all day long. Then Nathaniel exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Now, that's amazing. Because very few people came to that conclusion even after seeing all the things that Jesus did. Now I want you to notice Jesus' response. Look at verses 50 and 51. Jesus asked him, do you believe this just because I told you I'd seen you under the fig tree? <laughs> Son, you haven't seen anything yet. You will see greater things than this. And then he said, I tell you the truth. Now whenever Jesus says, I tell you the truth, or he says, verily, verily. In fact, in the Greek, that literally means stop, look, listen. I'm going to say something very important. So here Jesus says, and he says, I tell you the truth. In other words, stop, look, listen, put your focus up here. I'm going to tell you something really important. You will all see heaven open. And the angels of God going up and down on the Son of Man the one who is the stairway between heaven and earth. Now, of course, this is a reference to Jacob's dream. But did anyone catch what Jesus said about it in relationship to him? Because now he's taking Jacob's dream, which was symbolic. Remember, there's not a literal staircase. This is symbolic. But he's taking this symbolic dream, and now he's relating the symbolism to him. 
Did anyone catch how he related to him? He said, I am the stairway to heaven. Yeah, look at that again. I tell you the truth, you will all see heaven open and the angels of God going up and down on the Son of Man. Now, the reason I chose the NLT is because really this is an interpretation, not a translation. It doesn't actually say in the King James Version, I am the stairway of heaven. But it's what it means in the Greek. He says, you will see the angels of God going up and coming down upon the Son of Man. And the word upon is the Greek word epi. It means literally what the NLT says. I am the staircase that the angels of God are going up on and coming down on. You see, until Jesus came, only angels could travel from heaven to earth. There was no stairway to heaven for man to get from earth to heaven. But Jesus came so that we could go to heaven. You see, after his crucifixion and his descent into hell, Jesus rose from the dead and he opened the way to heaven. He laid captivity captive is what the book of Ephesians tells us. Now, here's what's interesting. Before Jesus came, the people who died believing that God was going to send a Messiah, who lived out their faith, when they died, they didn't, go to go, they didn't get to go to heaven. Why? Because there was no stairway to heaven. There was no way to get there. And the reason there was no way to get there is because their sins had never been completely paid for. They just had faith that one day it would be that God would send this Messiah, this seed of the woman, and he would take away the sin of the world. Isaiah 53 is very clear on what's going to take place. And they were looking for this Messiah. But until Jesus came, their sins had not been paid for completely. So when they died, they died in faith that this Messiah was coming. So when they died, their body went into the ground, but their spirit went to a place called the bosom of Abraham. It was next to hell, but there was a great gulf between the two. Hell was a place of torment, but the bosom of Abraham was a place of comfort. That's why Jesus told the thief on the cross this day, you will be with me in paradise. Because this was considered to be paradise, but it wasn't heaven yet. So when Jesus dies, he's put in the grave, his body goes into the grave, but his spirit goes to hell. And he does what? He, he comes in and he pays for our sins in hell, but then he actually does something that no one's ever seen before. This is such a great gulf that no one can pass between the two. The Gospels tell us, but he passes between them. And the scripture says that he preaches to those who are in captivity. Who? Those in the bosom of Abraham. So when he is raised from the dead, the scriptures say in Ephesians that he takes captivity captive. Now, there is a way to get from earth to heaven. And it's through Jesus. And so Jesus is talking about this symbolic staircase and he says... Man, you'll all see it. You'll see the resurrection. I am that staircase that once before only angels could go. They could only angels could go from heaven to earth and from earth to heaven. But he said, uh uh-uh. I am the staircase. And what I'm going to do is going to provide a way for man to go to heaven. So Jesus is figuratively the stairway to heaven. He's the means by which man can get to heaven. Now, the great thing is, Jacob's stairway applies to us today. Angels, people, are still coming and going to protect and to help those who are Abraham's descendants by faith. Now remember, in this dream, the whole symbolic meaning of it is, hey, I've made these promises to you, and I'm here to tell you that I have the means by which to fulfill them. And he saw these angels coming and going, and he understood the meaning God's got these angelic beings that are coming in and they're manipulating situations and circumstances. They are helping and they are protecting and they are here by our side to help fulfill these promises. And we need to understand that angels are still coming and going to protect and to help us because we are Abraham's descendants by faith. You see, we've been grafted into the family of Abraham by faith and God is sending out angels to help us just as he did for Jacob. Now, Let's get back to the story in Genesis chapter 28. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place and I wasn't even aware of it. But he was also afraid. And he said, What an awesome place this is. It is none other than the house of God, the very gateway to heaven. The next morning Jacob got up very early. He took the stone he had rested his head against. He set it upright as a memorial pillar. 
Then he poured olive oil over it. He named the place Bethel, which means house of God, although it was briefly called Luz. Then Jacob made this vow. If God will indeed be with me and protect me on this journey, and he will provide me with food and clothing, and if I return safely to my father's home, then the Lord will certainly be my God. And this memorial pillar I have set up will become a place for worshiping God, and I will present to God a tenth of everything he gives me. Now, it's at this point, because he's had this supernatural experience and God's spoken to him, that he says, ooh, you're going to be my God. God, you made these promises to me, and I'm going to step out. And as I step out and see your faithfulness, I'm going to put my complete faith in you. And then he makes this vow. He vows that Jehovah and only Jehovah will be his God. And when he returns one day and he sees these things fulfilled, he will faithfully tithe to him. Now this is interesting because tithing is taught all the way back in the Garden of Eden. Abraham tithed, the scriptures tell us. Jacob tithes. And something interesting happens. Now later on it's incorporated in the law. But remember, Galatians tells us the law was added because of transgressions. It was added in the law because people wouldn't keep it. But what's interesting is we get to the New Testament, and Jesus taught tithing, and Paul taught tithing. But here, Jacob is, and one of the reasons he knows about tithing is because his grandfather did it, and he'd heard the stories. And his dad did it, and he'd watched him, and he never quite got it. Why are you doing this? But when God speaks to him, he understands. Man, you're the God of everything. You're going to give me all this? This is your land, and you're telling me it's yours to give, and you're going to give it to me, and you're promising all these things? You're my God. God, I make this vow. You and only you will I worship, and I will tithe a tenth of everything I have. That's what tithe means is a tenth. But here's what's kind of interesting. It's written in the pile case which means not a one-time thing. It means continual action, repetitive action. He's saying, and I will always tithe whatever you give me. That, before the law, was ever given. 